Hello everyone and welcome to Beyond Covid, the show that takes a step back from the current crisis to ask what is it teaching us about how we all live? How can we build back better after the crisis? And what opportunities does this crisis provide for us to do things differently? My name's Jennifer Nadel and my co-host is Matt Hawkins and today we are delighted that Professor Danny Dorling has joined us on the show. Danny is a Professor of Geography at the University of Oxford and a visiting professor at Goldsmiths, Bristol and the Institute for Public Policy Research. He's the author of a huge number of books and articles including Inequality and the 1% and Injustice, Why Social Inequality Still Persists and his latest book, Slow Down, The End of the Great Acceleration, is out soon. Welcome, Danny. How are you managing during the lockdown? We adjust, don't we? I'm I'm beginning to get very bored. I'm obviously a bit frightened as well. I worry, I guess, most of all about what's going to happen to school leavers, people leaving at 18 or people leaving university at 21 this September. But we've got enough time to worry. You know, kind of, it's, we've got time's the one thing we've got much more of than we ever had right now. What would you like us to be doing right now? In respect to uh, that, when we had youth unemployment in the past, we had various schemes, some of which were very bad. Uh, there was a youth training scheme from the YTS from the 1980s, which analysis has been done on and actually showed it was detrimental. It's even better to be unemployed than to be forced onto the YTS. So my preference is to offer young people a very wide range of options. There's the obvious ones. The obvious ones are conservation volunteers where you, you know, help rebuild dry stone walls and so on. But, but the key thing is they have to be voluntary. You have to have an option, including an option of not doing any of them. You have to remember the dry stone walls up in the Yorkshire Dales, uh, the reason they look so nice is they're actually rebuilt by German and Italian prisons of war. People were forced to do this. So it may sound idyllic, but actually after the first day, it isn't. It's only April. If we can't think of a whole set of things to offer for young people to do, if they cannot get work straight away, it really is a pretty poor show. Now, moving on to your book, which we're very excited about, what do you mean by the great slowdown? And what, if we leave COVID aside for a second, is causing it? And is it something we can legislate for? Things were already slowing down long before COVID, and this this makes this pandemic different uh, from previous pandemics. The pandemic people look back at the most is the 1918-99 pandemic, which was enormous compared to this. That big influenza pandemic resulted in a fall, it's in the book, a fall in GDP worldwide of 14%, and then a rise the year after 16%. Because the world was accelerating at the time. The economic world was accelerating, the number of people in the world was accelerating. A pandemic wasn't going to have a huge effect on it. So the kind of common wisdom about pandemics is that they're terrible at the time, but you quickly forget them. However, the difference now is that the world was slowing. We were slowing in terms of population dramatically. We're slowing economically. People were already talking about a global recession. But if you step back, the rate of growth in the most recent decade was less than the decade before, which was less than the decade before. And you can take every decade from 1950 onwards, and economic growth is, was slowing. And so when something like this hits, it hits at a time when already we were worrying about where we were heading. We weren't on a kind of move forward, great technological progress forward. We were beginning to doubt whether we should be polluting the world as much. We were beginning to doubt whether people needed to fly this off. We were beginning to doubt whether advertising so relentlessly was such a good thing. That slowdown has been upon us for some time. We don't talk about slowdown. We, we still talk about things as if they're accelerating, but they haven't been. And we also tend to think of things slowing down as, as terrible, whereas what I try and argue in the book, and the book was completely finished before this pandemic began, is that a slowdown isn't necessarily bad at all. In many ways, it's absolutely essential. You just have to work out how to slow down in a way that's fair, in a way that doesn't leave people behind. What are the factors causing the slowdown? And are we seeing regional differences in the rate at which it is occurring? The thing which was unusual was the acceleration before the slowdown. Population explosion, going from a billion human beings, around about 1800, to approaching 8 billion now. That rate of population change has never happened before in the species, can never happen again technological innovation we've never had that rate of innovation before we'll probably never get it again over just 100 years ago 
we had the first tractor invented. It's only 100 years ago. We're used to this and we think of it as normal, but it isn't, it isn't normal. A generation living like the generation above them and the generation beneath them is what we should expect is normal. This idea that you're constantly going to change, that your children will get to travel around the planet even faster than you and further than you, just because it happened, and it happened because of the strange acceleration that the human species went through, doesn't mean it'll continue. Some places have begun to slow down more than others. The parts of Europe with lower population levels uh, were slowing down earlier, Spain and, and Italy, ironically, but Japan much earlier than them. We talk about slowdown in, in a negative way. So we talk about Japan and two lost decades of growth. We don't talk about Japan as a very stable society, as Tokyo as a city of low crime, of high public transport, a city that is now not changing usually. So you can see parts of the world which began slowing earlier. And the opposite is UK, which hates slow down, tries not to, constantly trying to innovate new ways to speed up, like the Big Bang in the city and so, and so on in the 80s. And the USA, where acceleration is seen as all important. You know, the, the idea, if you imagine trying to sell the idea in the US, let's just slow down and let's not have immense progress. It wouldn't be easy at all. But outside the United States, it's much easier to talk about how things going slow is a good idea. It's a fairly popular idea in Scandinavia. It's not a popular idea in poor parts of the world. And that there is still a need in the poorest parts of the world for living standards to get up to a basic level. So this kind of discussion about slowdown is really a discussion that you get in the richer countries of the world. You're talking about a slowdown slash recession as being a good thing, but... For most people listening, they will think recession, loss of jobs, debt, home repossessions, unemployment. Yeah. Talk, talk me through why this is like, why? something well, it, we're, we're pleased about. It depends how we deal with it. Like I said, GDP growth has been lower each decade since 1950 than the decade before. Now, if you assume that that's going to continue, and it's likely to continue, then you are looking at recessions to come. And you have to begin to deal with it differently. If you take home repossessions, what is the point of repossessing homes if there's nobody to sell those homes to? Uh, in the last great crisis, 2008, 2009 in the US, millions of homes, people defaulted on their mortgage. But the banks and building societies didn't repossess them because they needed the people to carry on living in them. Because if you actually leave a house empty for six months, it begins to fall apart. Uh, so we can already see part of the logic of what happens in a slowdown. The problem is that we still put fear into people because we still have a way of thinking that says we're accelerating. So housing is a great example. We behave as if people are having three or four children. So that the value of housing will rise in future because there won't be enough houses and apartments because there are going to be so many people. People haven't had more than two children since the late 1960s. But because before then we had to keep on building housing to cope with a growing population, we have a particular way of thinking that says you can simply chuck people out of their houses, you'll find somebody else to be a tenant. That does begin to end at a certain point. At that point, when we stop making families homeless because they've fallen behind on their rent and some mm. wonderful innovation happens, when do you see that happening and, and who is going to lead on it? Because if it's left to the banks, presumably it's going to be a patchwork. Yeah. In other countries already in Finland, they've decided that not only will no family be homeless, but no individual adult will be homeless. And they've got homeless down to a few dozen, a few dozen people. That has not been our experience here with homelessness. I mean, if you look between now and 2008 at what has happened to the level of families mm. living in insecure accommodation. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, we, so we, I'm just trying to match what you're saying to what we've yeah. experienced. We have the worst record on homelessness in all of Europe. Uh, the only country anywhere near us is Germany, and that was only because of the Syrian refugees. So. We were a country which, I think it has to be said, were using homelessness as a kind of threat. You don't have the worst record, the highest rates by accident. It was being used as a threat. If you don't behave, then this is what's going to happen to you. That resulted in a lot of people arguing about it and saying, oh, this is terrible campaigns, but they weren't particularly affected. The government did want to get the number of street homeless down. It was beginning to be slightly shamed by that. But it still thought it was perfectly okay to put families into single room bed and breakfast accommodation. Terrible. That is unusual in a European context. 
it's normal in the states in the states it's, it's fine for people with families to have living cars you know it's terrible but this difference between countries shows what's possible now the danger is we forget the current situation we're in the current situation we're in the people who have the worst circumstances now some of them may be isolated on their own but others are families trying to live in a single room which they're only allowed out for one hour a day when the entire family is in the b&b accommodation living within a few hundred meters of completely empty homes of which there are thousands in london you can walk around london at 9 30 at night at the moment and there are lights are not on as this crisis goes on calls begin to be made for getting people out of those b&b accommodations it's going to be a measure of our ability to what extent some of those calls are answered if we cannot do this with children in single rooms with their parents it's pitiful we have because of our self-interest because you know because our politicians care most about themselves and so on we have got the homeless off the streets instantly because we're worried that they would carry on passing the disease between themselves and that we would get it you know, as those of us in power but it does show what's possible doesn't it Yes, and it's similar, if you go back to the 1840s, when cholera came to London and the affluent were fearful of getting cholera, they suddenly decided they're willing to build a sewer system for everybody. You know, you can, you can see the logic more clearly and a lot of it isn't particularly nice. But as things are slowing down, as you cannot make them accelerate again, there does come a point where even if your inherent politics are not nice politics, you know, it, it doesn't make any sense to say we're going to put the fear of God into everybody to try to make them work harder. There will not be enough work. There will not be enough work in the near future. So why are you going to make people still apply for 30 jobs every two weeks? If I were a detractor from your views, mm. I would say, so you're going to pay people for doing nothing. And that's the kind of dependency culture which, mm. you know, austerity was meant to tackle. We were paying people very little for doing a lot that's the thing that's become obvious from the crisis that those people who are most vital are paid least those people who are paid the most are no longer doing very much work it's very mean that the highlighting has been on the professional football and it's quite telling you know it's very easy to see professional footballers who are not playing still getting these normal salaries but of course for every single professional footballer there are something like 20 to 40 people in finance getting that same salary still who are not making huge amounts of money for their bank or the country at the moment it's very easy to make these arguments in the middle of a pandemic. It's a bit like arguing for solidarity in the middle of a war. The danger is, as you get out of it, as the number of cases go, you're already seeing relaxation in Italy and Spain. The desire of people who like making a lot of money to get back to what they had before, the desire of landlords to be able to charge very high rents, is so high that a small group of people will try very hard to get back to business as normal. So what do we have to do now, Danny, to ensure that we do not return to business as usual? One way that it is possible to keep this way of thinking alive is to remind people that just because you've just had a pandemic doesn't mean you can't get another one next year. There's no logic or law that says the big ones come every 20 years or 50 years. The numbers of new diseases that emerge are partly a product of the density of people and you can try and do various things to reduce the number of new diseases that emerge, but we will still get new diseases. And so you need to plan for a world which can cope with that, which isn't a world in which you're, if you can, you're flying all over the place as much as possible. And it's not a world in which you encourage an industry which is offshore, offshore tax industry of cruise liners. It was a ridiculous kind of height of extravagance, wasn't it? You have said before that you think the level of inequality in the UK cannot persist for much longer because it is so costly and, frankly, because it is embarrassing. Do you think that the light COVID has shone on the level of inequality in the UK will now provide an impetus for reducing it? I think it already was swinging. <laughs> so there were tiny examples. The, the FTSE 100 CEOs, at the highest paid People in the, in the 100 richest firms in Britain uh, last year took a £100 an hour pay cut on average. What's happening now is a wealth equalisation. Most of our wealth in Britain is held in the form of housing or pensions. The pension funds have seen dramatic falls in their value because they're invested in stocks and shares. We don't yet know about housing, but the idea that central London will carry on being the most expensive place in Europe is hard to countenance. Landlords are going to have trouble paying the mortgage 
because tenants are going to have trouble paying the rent. That reduces the value of housing and again reduces the, the wealth. So if you were wonderfully and magically made Chancellor tomorrow, <laughs> what would you do to protect homes, reduce inequality and most importantly of all, transition the economy? For homes, I would bring in rent regulation. The rents will be fixed. They'll be fairer. In many cases, they will actually be reduced where they are excessive. I would move to the German system where you cannot be asked to leave your home, but your landlord is allowed to offer you money. And if you take it, you leave, but otherwise you can stay as long as you can pay the rent. That gives people a sense of security. Government and local councils should do what they did in the 70s, which is buy up at auction, buy at the bottom of the market property, which doesn't sell at the moment. We do need to encourage people through the tax system not to have two or three or four homes. I'm not saying you shouldn't let people have two or three or four homes, but they should just pay an enormous amount of tax if they feel that for some reason one or two homes is not enough for them. You know, The great advantage that Britain has got is that we have models from other European countries that are better than us. We're not having to invent this out of thin air. You just begin to say, what do they do in Vienna? The housing system in Vienna, this isn't some kind of utopian social and socialist kind of dream. It's something that's worked for decade after decade. What happens in Vienna that we could yeah. learn from? Vienna has a very large social housing sector where the landlord is the city where the quality is very high and the rents are very low and it works. They don't do right to buy and they don't have the idea that your council housing should be smaller and shabbier than your state housing. One lovely thing we have here is a huge amount of underused housing because often elderly people are sitting in housing that's too large for them but not moving to something smaller because the smaller housing doesn't exist locally. And while house prices are going up, they make more money for their grandchildren and children by hanging on. And suddenly that four bedroom house worth over a million is just a prison. This is the irony, the irony of what's being revealed at the moment. You're not going to get revolution, but you get a number of changes. With it. We saw this in the First World War. Rent regulation came in in the First World War. It often requires events that you haven't predicted which go on for longer than a few weeks. The First World War is supposed to last a few weeks or a few months. Now, finally, my last question, if I can just ask you, we've had these huge shocks to the system before. We had 9-11, but our reaction to it was a horrendous war that killed millions. Mm. We had the 2008 austerity, the, the crash, but then we had austerity. How do we make sure that we don't have a response to this crisis, which causes more social harm. So I, I wouldn't say we always get it wrong, but of course we wouldn't be in this terrible situation now if we had got it right. The other thing is to look back at a century, at the time when we did bring down inequalities, at a time when we did house people better. And that wasn't just one event at the First World War, it was also the Russian Revolution, it was a general strike, it was a suffragette movement, it was a union. And it was arguing and arguing and arguing, and it took 20 years. And only a tiny part of that was the pandemic, the biggest pandemic we've had for centuries, the 1918 pandemic. If you want the sense of things being different, this pandemic, which is minuscule in comparison to 1918, has economically and socially in terms of travel and policy had a much bigger effect already. So I do think it's hard to think that we won't learn from this because you can already say some things have changed utterly in how we treat each other. And that isn't something we had expected. Originally, governments were going to simply let this thing play out. But partly because China and Korea and Japan wouldn't, and these aren't countries that we often look at for models. There is a sort of sad racism, I think, in, in our policy where we tend to look at the USA and the rest of Europe, but we don't tend to look to countries in the East. The policy in those countries was individual lives matter incredibly and we are going to stop this. And that was different. And if you want a sort of sense that things different have changed from 9-11 or the 2008 crash, the fact that we have followed on from policy made in Korea and in China and Japan, I think that's worth learning from. Slight change of focus now, Danny. Can you tell us the one thing you struggled with most during the lockdown and your guilty pleasure for dealing with it? I didn't realise how much comfort I took from daily routines. 
I didn't realise how much I liked just going into the office at a certain time. I liked getting on the train. Those things that we often complain about. You know, you, you complain about commuting. It's not until you actually miss it. Or you complain about having to go into work until you miss it. It's that, missing my routines, which give you a certain uh, degree of security. Guilty comforts. I mean, one, I suppose, I'm normally a smoker. And if you needed anything, I mean, okay, logically, it was stupid to smoke at my age anyway. But so, of course, I haven't smoked for, what, four weeks now? <laughs> so, so my kind of guilty secret is I do feel much better because, sadly, I'm so weak-willed. This is what it took for me to stop. And I do hope I carry on. Oh, well, I'm glad even if it took a global pandemic. <laughs> yes, I'm afraid so. <laughs> yeah. Thank you ever so much. And a huge thank you, Danny Dorling, for taking time to talk to us about life beyond COVID. Beyond COVID is part of the Real Agenda Network, produced by Kitty Horlick and brought to you by Compassion in Politics. And that was the last in our current series of Beyond COVID. Next week, we'll see the start of a brand new series entitled simply Compassion in Politics. To kick that off, we'll be interviewing Professor Paul Gilbert, OBE, psychologist, president of the Compassionate Mind Foundation and best-selling author of over 20 books on compassion. He'll be sharing some fascinating psychological insights about the current crisis. We hope you will join us then. We'd also love to hear from you, so please do get in touch with any comments or feedback. You can find us online at compassioninpolitics.com. And don't forget to subscribe. You can find us on Apple, Spotify or any of your other favourite podcast providers by searching for Compassion in Politics. Thanks for joining us and we look forward to being with you again soon.